evaluate our sources. Um, the book Genealogy Standards, published by the Board for Certification of Genealogists, includes a discussion of source analysis that really highlights what we need to be doing every time we look at our sources. So this is standard 35, and it says simply, as they examine potentially relevant sources, genealogists appraise each source's likely accuracy, integrity, and completeness. This appraisal considers the source's characteristics. Now its characteristics should include things like physical condition, legibility, whether it's an original or a derivative or what's called an authored narrative. Uh, we look at things like internal and external consistency, source history, provenance, purpose, time lapse between events and the recording, and it go, you can go on from there. But what this standard is basically telling us is that we have to look at the source in front of us and be able to identify factors which could affect our assessment of that source which would then affect our conclusion. Things like provenance, legibility, um, the classification of the source itself. These are all things that need to be considered when we're looking at a document which holds what could be a signature or a mark of our research subject. So keep this description in mind as we move forward because we'll be referring to it throughout and it's something to just kind of put a pin in and keep with you as you're doing your research. So as we just looked at standard 35 it mentioned how sources can be originals or derivatives or authored narratives and originals are simply that. They are the first version of that source, whether it's a written record or a photograph or even like an audio video recording, right? Because that too is a source. Derivatives then are those sources that are created from the originals or created after the original usually, but not all the time. And then we have authored narratives, which are best described as kind of a mix. Um, one of the best examples of an authored narrative would be those historical narratives that tells a story of one family and they kind of compile information taken from several sources, including both original and derivative sources. And then those histories will often also have the compiler's own narrative writing. So hopefully we've all seen those. They're, they're usually older books you find in libraries sometimes about the such and such family you know for 100 or 200 years those kinds of things are often fall under this this authored narrative category <clears throat> sometimes though the source analysis may not be quite so easy to characterize even determining whether a source is an original or a derivative may not be as easy as we would hope. And I can show you an example of that problem here. So this is one of my favorite documents. It's a really fun example to use for all kinds of reasons. So I use it a lot. Um, but for our purposes, it's a really good example to show the difficulties when we're trying to assess our sources. So what this is, is a 17th century will for a woman named Verlinda Stone. Verlinda died in Maryland. And if we zoom in on that signature section that was down at the bottom, we see a lot of really cool marks and signatures for women in this will. And keep in mind, this will is dated 1675. It's great stuff. It's, it's the kind of stuff that we get excited about when we see. But don't get too excited because this is a trap. Because you'll see these marks in your signatures and you're going to start to think, great, this is an original will, right? I mean, this looks like people were trying to write their names and you would be wrong. How can we tell that? How is this document 
with all those cool squiggly marks and that attempt by what we thought was the, the decedent to write her name, how is this not the original? So for starters, if we go back to this first image here, just take a look and see if anything strikes you. And the first thing that I saw was that this appears to be a book. It's not a loose page. This is actually a page from a county will book. And obviously the dying person is not going to have the county will book on their lap as they're writing their will, right? Um, so that's a pretty good indicator. Another one is the handwriting itself. So here's a closer look at the body of Verlind as well. And if you take a look at the next image, here is the proving statement that's on the following page. And then here's kind of the two together. Now, the proving of a will was done, obviously, separately from the writing of the will in cases other than those non-cupative oral wills, those kinds of things. But in this case, the proving statement would have been written by the clerk when someone presented the will of the deceased to the court. So the handwriting shouldn't be the same as that of the will if the will is original, right? Because the clerk would be writing it, not the decedent. But the handwriting in the body of this will is the same as the proving statement, and not just the same as the proving statement. This handwriting is the same as other wills that appear on the subsequent pages of this will book, and they all bear different dates, far apart. And that's another indication that this is not an original will. Another way to check is just by looking at record group descriptions, for instance, on the web repository's website. Um, sometimes the front of the book that you're looking at can also tell you exactly what you're looking at. So in this case, this is an image from the, I believe it's the front back cover of a microfilmed county will book. And we get this handy little note that explains that the contents of this will book, which includes copies of wills from the 17th century, also goes all the way into 1785. And the note here is dated 1785. So we're talking over 100 years after the date of Verlinda's will, which was in the 1600s, right? So we know that this is a clerk's copy of Verlinda's will. But then what is the deal with all those marks and signatures that we saw? And here they are again, because they're just super cool, I think. So what we have here is a copy of a will where the clerk who copied it into the book attempted to reproduce the marks and signatures. And you might be surprised to know that this actually isn't an uncommon thing. We'll see another example of this in a little bit, but clerks copying wills and deeds, for example, did sometimes attempt to reproduce the marks and signatures when they were making what's known as record copies for use by the court. So this example, <clears throat> with its copied signatures brings us back to that tricky distinction between originals and derivatives. How then do we classify a document that was copied a hundred years after the original, but still maintains the form and the format of original marks and signatures? And what if the original no longer exists at this point? Would this document qualify as an original since it's the only copy in existence? To help us answer some of these questions, there are three further classifications that we can make when we're assessing whether our sources are originals or derivatives. They could be record copies, duplicate originals, or image copies, for instance. So we mentioned that the copy of Verlinda's will that we looked at is a record copy. Again, these are clerk's copies, usually in official books or registers for use by the court. 
duplicate originals are documents created at the same time as the originals, often by the same person. Again, this is this is usually like a clerk who's making a copy. And then we have image copies and image copies are photos or copies of original documents where no part of the original image is being altered or changed. Now, all three of these record types could be termed originals depending on the record itself. In county records, often the closest we may ever be able to get to the original is a clerk's copy. But again, as we saw with Verlinda Stone's will, making that distinction, saying that it's a record copy, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can't use it. Because clearly, just because something may technically be a clerk's copy rather than a document that your subject actually signed, it doesn't mean that his signature or her signature was necessarily lost. But the point we need to understand is that we need to be able to identify what exactly we're looking at so that we're not basing all of our research on incorrect information, or in this case, a signature or mark that isn't actually that of our subject. We just need to be able to accurately assess our sources and be able to make that distinction. So we kind of did a, a quick and dirty discussion about sources and how to evaluate them. So now we're going to get to the fun part. Where can we find our own signatures and marks for our research subjects? But before we dive into a few of these examples, I, I do want to make a couple of points. Um, first, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. This is really just a starting point um, for us today. This, it's really important here for you to take the initiative and thoroughly research the time and the place of interest for your project to find out what's available um, and what may be relevant to your research question. Um, you might have heard people talk about creating locality guides. That would be helpful here. And what that means is you're basically doing a little background research to find out about extant records in the time and place that you're working in. A lot of times people will create a locality guide um, every time they're working in a new county, for instance, definitely new state, um, and they'll just save them and keep them on their shelf as part of their reference library so that they have that, that resource to, to look back on later on whenever they need it. The other point that I wanted to make here is that you're probably going to assume that my suggestion here is going to be for you to search all of the applicable records where your subject will be the focus. For instance, you know, let's say your subject was a Civil War veteran. You're going to want to look for his pension file if he had one, because of course you would. If you discover he re received a pension, you, you definitely want to see that. But don't have blinders on about the likelihood that he may also have supplied testimony of his association with family members or neighbors in their pension applications, because he would have signed those documents there too, right? People did not live in isolation. So when we're talking about trying to find records for these folks, we need to acknowledge this interaction between family members and business associates and neighbors and, you know, the, the, the guy who owned the general store in town, all those folks. And just remember to look to the records of those people as well. So I put here first, original wills and deeds. They seem like an obvious option, but there is a bit of a caveat here because they can be hard to find. Um, in the case of original deeds, for instance, a lot of times the original deed was lost. Um, so really the only signature you're going to get is if you were the seller 
uh, and maybe, you know, a wife or a family member if they were named as parties. Um, so if you're wanting the, the signature of the buyer, it's not going to help you anyway, even if you are able to find them. What's at the courthouse is usually, in the case of deeds especially, is, it is usually going to be a, re a recorded copy or a clerk's copy. Now, again, remember, like we saw with Verlinda, that doesn't mean you won't be able to use it necessarily, but it's critical information that we do need to be aware of. Depending on the time and place, you may get lucky and find something like this original will. Uh, this is an example uh, dated 1704. This is the will of John Boyd, and you can see his seal is also still there a bit. Um, so they are out there. Notice his use of that I as his initial for John. This is not unusual in the American colonial and, and early modern period. But it can be a dis distinguishing mark, especially if there happen to be several John Boyds living in the same place at the same time. So you definitely would want to know if he was the only one who used that mark, IB, uh, if the other John Boyd that was living in the same place at the same time, maybe he used JB, you would have an identifying tool here. Expanding on the use of wills, uh, another good place to look for marks and signatures are in probate packets. And these vary from place to place. So you may not be familiar with what this is, or at least you may think that you aren't. Um, this is an example from Indiana. And what you have here, ideally, are all of the documents for probating an estate all folded up together and then they're placed in a jacket and unfortunately a lot of the ones that I've seen are missing their jackets so then you run into the issue where there might be missing or misfiled documents um, but you might still see packets with their jackets from time to time so when I say they include all of the probate documents what we're talking about is things like administration accounts, all of them, and often there are multiples of those, uh, inventories, uh, and receipts. All of these are original documents, so signatures are everywhere. For the decedent, for the administrator, we've got neighbors and associates in town who traded or conducted business with the decedent. And then we get we have family members as well. Now, in some locations, these packets have been taken apart and the papers inside have been filed individually. So for instance, a repository will, might have the administrator's accounts all filed together separately, and then they'd have a separate group for the inventories. And if they still have the receipts, then those would be separated as well. So instead of looking for a complete packet, what you're going to look for is each of those probate documents separately. And the other thing to keep in mind is that not all locations have saved things like receipts. So here again, it's, it's critical that you do your research on the record availability in your subject area. So I mentioned receipts. And as part of the probate process, if the decedent owed money to anyone, those who were owed the money needed to alert the administrator or executor for payment so that the estate could settle all of the debts. So basically what you're finding in these packets are like little pieces of paper that are IOUs from the decedent to say a neighbor or a shop owner or, you know, all of these people that he or she was conducting business with, and they were presented to the administrator as proof of the debt so that they could get paid from the estate. So if receipts are available in your time and place of interest, they can be well worth checking out. And don't think it's just men who were found in the receipts. Uh, this is a receipt from Susan Williamson, 
and her late husband served as an administrator for his father's estate, but he died before the estate was settled. So this is a receipt showing that Susan was paid money that was owed to her husband by the replacement administrator. And we can see on this receipt that Susan made an X mark on the receipt, but these packets and their documents can also include signatures for women, like this one. Uh, this is a letter to the probate court from the widow of Isaac Barnes. And in it, she's affirming her husband's death and then she gives the full land description of the property that he owned at the time of his death. And she also notes that she married again after the death of that first husband, and she provides her new surname and the name of her new husband. And then at the bottom, we get this really great set of signatures showing her with her first married name and her second. Now, the, the, the background on this is that Isaac Barnes died sometime prior to February 1835. So having this information, both of Ro Ruth's second marriage and her names and signatures in the 1830s is really something when you remember this woman likely has never appeared on a federal census by name at this point. This county in Indiana also experienced a pretty serious courthouse fire. So again, having this document with the history of this woman and her identities through time is a really great find. So again, track down these packets and see if they exist in your, your research area. They can be well worth it. <clears throat> Land entry case files. These are particularly of interest if you had ancestors that moved moved west and purchased land. Uh, you can find signatures in these files. They're held uh, by the National Archives. And this is an example uh, where Lee Gilkison was purchasing, purchasing land from the Crawfordsville office in Indiana. This is what's called a register's receipt. And you can see that Lee signed the register's receipt and then at the bottom there, they've attached an affidavit from Lee himself stating that the land was entered in his name for his use alone and that the intended use was for cultivation. So he was going to farm the land. And then at the bottom, he signed the affidavit again. So we've actually got two original signatures here that we can now use to compare with any other documents we may find while researching Lee to help establish identity. And I can tell you this family loved to reuse the same names. So we run into the more than one person running around at the same name at the same time with this group. So having these signatures can be a, a really great tool. Next, obviously, letters and manuscripts. You guys are probably familiar with that kind of thing. Um, you can find those usually through local archives, and then we get online databases like Archive Grid. Hopefully, you've all uh, played around with Archive Grid a little bit, but just in case, it's it's a really great way to search for local archives near you and search their record collections all over the country. You can also search collections internationally as well. So if your research takes you outside the U.S., you, you can check them out too and hopefully find something good. Next is military records. Uh, military records can be a boon for original signatures. I mentioned pension records earlier. Also, draft cards can include signatures, not just for your ancestor, but other family members and associates as well. So if you've taken the time and built up that network of family and associates, these would be a really good place to search for those identifying marks and signatures, not just for your subject, but for everyone in, in that network. You can also find things like this in military records. This is a page showing proof of ownership for an enslaver 
who is attesting to the fact that a man who enlisted in the Union Army had been his slave and the owner, the previous owner, is trying to claim payment because Maryland was a compensated emancipation state. And you can see Isaac's signature down at the bottom on this page. We even get a couple of signatures of witnesses who were actually Isaac's neighbors. So we get a really good example of casting that wide net and looking for records for neighbors and associates to find valuable information and signatures for your research target. Now, a side note about this particular document is that while most would probably think that this correspondence, this type of document, would have been found in a pension packet, these claims are actually filed in the service record packets. And you may be familiar with those cards. Um, they were created well after the war, and they were copied from original records, which often are no longer open to public access. Some have been destroyed. Some may be held locally. So the point being, public access is, is a little tricky on those. Um, so you wouldn't think to find anything that would include original signatures there. But again, if you do your research on the time and place of your subject and you know the laws, you'll be able to find things like this. This is another cool one. Um, in military records, um, the backstory is that during the last, mm, I want to say 25 years or so of the 19th century, the War Department arranged groups of records that had been captured during the Civil War. And one of these groups were slave payroll records, which documented the work of slaves for the Confederate government during the Civil War. But these lists also include information about the slave owners, and in some cases, names their legal representation who acknowledged the work. Now, this record group can include a bunch of other inf uh, records, like there's things like um, power of attorney papers are in this as well. And it's not even solely a group of lists of slaves alone. We also find free people of color here and um, working, usually farming whites also can be listed. But as you can see here, we get a column for signature. Now, the signature was the acknowledgement that the work had been performed and that the owner or the individuals themselves, if they were free, they were paid for the work. So you'll see some names here that don't match the name of the owner. And again, they might have the ATTY designation for attorney. Um, but there are original signatures here for the owners and laborers. And this is one of many, many record groups that contain original signatures in the National Archives. So here again, we're gonna we're kind of hammer this home that it's super important that you do your research for your time and place of interest. This is an easy one. Captions on photographs. A lot of times these get overlooked, um, but we have to remember in those boxes of photos that we've got that have names written on them, I used to assume that they were written by somebody else, just whoever could identify the people in the photo, but don't assume that. Sometimes the handwriting that you find on those photographs is the individual you're looking for. So pay attention to the writing that you find on those photos that might help you. So this is a big one, marriage bonds, applications, and consents. And we're going to look how, about how to use uh, marriage bonds for signatures a little bit later. But real quick, I wanted to mention marriage applications a little bit. Because in many locations, the use of marriage applications may not have begun at the same time that marriage licenses were recorded. 
or they may have begun early but stopped, or there could be any number of variables involved in their keeping and in their availability within a locale. So because of this, I find a lot of people forget about them or they just discount them because they don't think they're available. One big reason for this is, you know, when people write to order, quote, marriage records from the county, or they pull up marriage records, the general term, from things like family search microfilms, they may only see the license or maybe the license and the return from the minister. And they maybe just don't think that an application is available because it's not with the rest of the stuff. But Applications were often filed separately from the licenses, so it's definitely worth looking just a little bit deeper to see if this is something that may be available to you in your time and area of interest. Because marriage applications, if you've seen them, you know they can be a gold mine, and they also can often include signatures, original signatures. This is an example um, of an application from the, now this county separated. They had two different books for the marriage applications. One was for the males, one was for the females. So in addition to their signatures that you see at the bottom, you also get information about their parents and date of birth, their residence and all of that. There's the signature there at the bottom. And remember, because a separate book for the females we would get a signature of the bride too. That third marriage record I mentioned here is a marriage consent. And generally when the bride or the groom was under the required age to marry, a parent or a guardian, usually the father, could give his consent for the marriage to occur. Usually you'll see this like when a daughter gets married to an older man, that seems to be the most common thing. Um, in that case, the father would just kind of give his A-OK -okay on it. And you may not find these consents in all locations at all times, especially because in some places, in some times, that consent could have been given verbally in person. So there would be nothing for the parent or guardian to sign. So check the local statutes at the time you're researching and see what was required to marry so that you get an idea of what kinds of records may exist. If the written consents exist in the time and place that you're researching, you found a great thing because it's usually going to be the father who will sign it or make his mark. So you'll get his name and he'll mention his daughter or his son and provide their name and sometimes witnesses as well. So you could have a really good document. Social security applications. These are a more modern place you can find uh, original signatures. Hopefully you're all familiar with those. Next is passport applications. Now there's a large collection of passport applications. Hopefully some of y'all have seen these available on sites like Ancestry. And they've really made these records available to a lot of people because it's a huge, I mean, this collection covers a huge date span and it makes it really likely for most people to be able to find someone who may have traveled at some point and their application would be included and is made available online. So this is an example of one of those passport applications. This one is dated 1924. It's for James Creighton Ward, and he gives all of his biographical information and travel information. And then at the bottom, we get his signature, which you can see a little better here. But it gets a little better because we also get the signature for his wife. That's not all, though. This collection also includes passport applications for his father, and here's his signature. And we get one more, we get the grandfather. And there's his signature there. So in one online collection on Ancestry, I got signatures for three generations of this family, all in the passport collection. 
And these signatures can now be taken and correlated with local records to confirm identities. And I can tell you they've already come in handy for me because one of these men appeared to go to California. But because his name was so common that James Ward, I wasn't sure if the person that I was seeing in California was the same man as this one who was born in Massachusetts and lived in New York. So the signature and the identifying information from the application, I was able to use that and match it with local records and match it with a military record that placed him in California following service in the Mexican-American War. So these passport applications were great evidence that I could correlate with everything else that I had collected to prove that what looked like it had been two separate men was actually one guy. As we're moving through our list here, petitions. I think a lot of people forget about this, um, but if your ancestor or your research target was involved in community or state and federal or federal social or like religious movements, that's a big one, they may have signed a petition. And these can be found usually in state repositories or even the National Archives. Uh, this is, let's see, I've got an example of one from, uh, this is a suffrage petition. And this one happens to be signed by Frederick Douglass as well. Um, local repositories like county, state, historical societies, archives, as well as the National Archives, they have petitions like this one for all kinds of issues. Suffrage we see here. Also, temperance was a big one. Uh, there are Christian society movements. Those are also popular topics. So if you believe that your research subject may have been involved in their community or with topics, causes of the day, it, it may be worth looking for petitions to see if they may have signed something like this. This particular petition is also available online uh, with the anniversary a couple years ago of the 19, the ratification of the 19th Amendment. A lot of repositories seem to have gone through their collections and made petitions like this one available online, so you may get lucky that way as well. So the last thing I've got on my little list here is naturalization documents. And as part of the nationaliz naturalization process, applicants had to submit declarations of intent, and these should include the applicant's oath relinquishing their loyalty from their country of birth to their new home country. And the oath should include their signature at the bottom. Okay, so we've seen a lot of examples now of signatures, but what if you found your subject in a census and as you're looking at the columns, you see this, the columns for cannot read, cannot write, they've been checked. Or maybe you've come across that dreaded X mark in your research. You've opened up a deed or a will book and you just see pages and pages of the standard kind of X mark, and you assume that using signatures to help with your research just isn't going to be possible. But that's not necessarily true. Sometimes the clerks didn't bother copying the signatures, signatures and marks, but that doesn't mean that everything, every transaction that they ever conducted would appear that way. It just means that we can't determine whether our subject couldn't sign his name or that they didn't have a distinguishing mark from just one document. Just seeing that X mark on the one document, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be completely out of luck. What it does mean is like every other part of your research, one document does not constitute proof. 
you need to look for more records to see if you can find anything they did sign or if there are other records that prove or disprove your assertion. So if we go back to that standards guide that we brought up way, way, way at the beginning, we get a little extra help from standard 17, which covers extent, and standard 47, which covers evidence correlation. And the two standards explain to us that you need to undergo a plan of research that has the depth and the breadth to be able to test your evidence, to test your hypotheses. Correlating your evidence to discover any similarities or differences by definition requires that you have more than one thing in order for you just to be able to do that comparison and, 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 and the contrasting. Right. I mean, you need more than one thing to be able to do that. So when we're trying to understand how to use marks and signatures to prove or to disprove identities in our research, having one document that says someone can't read or write or on the flip side, having one document with some kind of mark on it, it shouldn't be the make or break of our case. That one document needs to be correlated with others that you found in the course of your research. The other point is that just because you see the tick mark on the census designating that your subject couldn't read or write, remember that it doesn't necessarily mean that anything bearing their mark won't be helpful, helpful to you in establishing a subject's identity. You still need to find those records because your subject may have utilized a distinctive mark. And we saw a couple of those distinctive marks in the Verlinda Stone example. Here are a couple of additional examples of, of distinguished, I'm sorry, distinctive marks, which were used to help sort identities for two men that had the same name, they were living in the same place at the same time. So these marks came from a case where a father and a son, like I said, had the same name. They lived in the same place. They both used distinctive marks, but each of their marks were slightly different. And these marks were consistently copied by the clerks over the course of a few decades. So that really assisted with proper identification and sorting, which was the father and which was the son which documents we're talking about the son and which we're talking about the, the father. I mean, we're talking about two men named Thomas Hinton. And if I'm reading a deed and let's say the no wife was mentioned or, you know, both of their wives were named Mary, how do you tell the difference between who's who using these distinguishing marks? So we've talked about sources and how we should be evaluating them. And we've talked about where to find those signatures and marks. So now we're gonna get into this last piece of the puzzle. How do we incorporate this type of evidence into our case studies when we're trying to prove a case of identity? Well, we get some help from several case studies that were published in the National Genealogical Society quarterly these case studies look at the use of signatures and marks, and I put a few references in the handout. Um, I know in some places, the we call it the NGSQ, the, the quarterly, not all libraries carry it. Um, if you can find one, you know, go through WorldCat and try and find a library that has, that, that carries the journal, uh, it would be helpful to look over some of these case studies, but even better than that, is to join the National Genealogical Society. You get access to the full archive of all of the articles going back decades and decades and decades. So it, it's worth the cost of membership, I think, to have access to that archive of material. But the first example uh, I just wanted to, to highlight for you, this is Ron Hill's 1999 article on the Colwells from Cornwall, England. He actually wrote another article on the Colwells. This is like a long, long-term project for him. Um, 
But this this first article, this 1999 off article, offers a lot more detail on his process and integrating signatures into his case study. In this case study, he uses signatures that he found in wills, administrator's bonds, um, church records. He also used overseers of the poor records. And then he makes the distinction between those image copies that we talked about earlier. These were image copies from Family Search Microfilm. And then originals that were held in various repositories. And then he also includes several really helpful footnotes where he discusses how images, including signatures, were viewed and how best to view them yourself. And one last really cool part of this case study is his look at the scientific analysis of handwriting characteristics. This is not a point that's typically discussed in genealogical periodicals, and it's really fascinating talking about how people um, formed their letters. Um, and he includes some great references in this work as well that that would be fun to check out if you're interested in paleography. A second example uh, is K. Rocket's 1998 analysis and discussion of four documents where she looks at signatures, penmanship, uh, name variations, all of these things to answer the question of whether two men were actually one. So it's a it's a, just a really great example of how to use the evidence gained through signature analysis with other interrelated evidence to build and ultimately reach a conclusion. And then finally, there's uh, my own article from the National Genealogical Society Quarterly. And in it, um, I use distinctive marks as indirect evidence to link the identity of a man who married in Kentucky under the name Arthur Garrison and a man who lived and died in Indiana under the name Arda. So this identification was actually the second part of this case study. The original goal was simply to find parentage for a man named Green Garrison. Green was born about 1815 in Indiana, according to later census information, that is, and he died during the Civil War. So I didn't have the benefit of something like a civil death certificate to tell me who his parents were, and I didn't get much help from things like probate records. There's no obituary. You know, I didn't get a lot of other stuff. So I just started trying to track him backwards in time. So he was living in Iowa in 1860. You can see him here with his presumed wife and then several other young adults of the same surname. He was in Illinois in 1850. So I could see that he was moving west for a, a part of his adult life. When it came to 1840, I had a little bit of an issue because there were three men of the same name and the same approximate age. And we're talking between like one to two years apart. And they were all living in three different states, all of which could have been possibilities for the right green. Fortunately, I got a little bit of a hint because only one was living next door to the family of the correct greens wife. And you can see this is the grouping. Um, so I was able to sort the right man out right here. Um, the correct Green Garrison family was living in Indiana at the time of the 1840 census. But in 1830, I run into another problem because Green would have been underage. So he likely would have been living with his parents and he wouldn't have appeared by name. Well, I got a clue in Green's Civil War pension, which led to the identity of a younger sister, Melinda. She lived in another Indiana county, and this is the document from that pension. Um, Green's widow included a page from their family Bible, and then she wrote this little note to accompany that page where she explains that some of the entries on the Bible page 
were actually written by Green's brother-in-law. His name was Coonrod Williamson, which I'm assuming is a take on Conrad. Or, um, but he married Melinda Garrison in Park County, Indiana. And census records told me she was pretty young when they married. So the search turned to Park County, Indiana, where I found three garrisons in 1830 who had children the proximate age of Green and Melinda. So we got Arla, and I'm assuming this is Arda. They just didn't cross their T. John F. Garrison and then Jonathan Garrison. So I had to research all three of these men. Uh, after researching them, it seemed most likely that Arda was the father of Green and Melinda. And looking at deed records for Arda, I identified his wife. It looked like he just had one wife throughout. Her name was Mary. And Arda and Mary seemed to be moving west with Green. Uh, I had set up timelines. The timelines were lining up really closely. But time and place alone do not establish a relationship. So I needed more. Early on in the research, there was one family that was appearing frequently as neighbors. And eventually they even became extended family members to the garrisons. The Turleys also migrated from Indiana to Illinois to Iowa, and eventually they were living in Missouri, which is where Green's widow lived following his death. And a sister of Green's wife even married a Turley. His name was Ignatius Turley, and you can see her signature, or I should say her mark, uh, uh, marking on an affidavit in Green Garrison's Civil War pension file. So then I started tracking the Turleys, and that took me to Warren County, Kentucky, where I found this. In 1811, Paul Turley signed a marriage bond for the marriage of Arthur Garrison to Polly Turley. You may be aware Polly is a nickname for Mary. That was the name of Arda's wife and the date for this bond. And the subsequent marriage, the same year, all of this fits in really well with Green and Melinda's dates of birth. But can we say that Arthur Garrison of Kentucky is the same person as Arta Garrison of Indiana and Illinois at this point? Well, no. If we look at the bond, Arthur made his mark with a pattern of dots. And it kind of forms, it's got the three dots there. It's almost like an L shape. It's pretty distinctive. And while the deeds I found for Arda Garrison in Indiana and Illinois had him using a mark rather than a signature, the clerks there were not copying any distinctive mark. They were just making that, you know, the dreaded X that we see. So I needed to find something else and I needed to find specifically an original document to compare with this. Well, I found it. In the Indiana Land Office records, Arda bought land there in the 1820s, and in one file, he assigned his land to someone else, and he had to sign off on the transfer. And we get the mark he made on that document. Here's the two together. So you can see that same distinctive dot formation. And, you know, it's easy to say that Arda sounds like a nickname for Arthur, and you can say, well, Kentucky is close to Indiana and Illinois, but that doesn't mean that Arthur in Kentucky is the same as the Arda in Indiana and Illinois. So you've got to get your feet on more solid ground. You can establish that correct identity that we talked about in the way back very beginning, if you can remember that far back, but you can establish that when you can say that Arthur in Kentucky and Arda in Indiana and Illinois shared not just the same associates and family, but he also had the same distinctive mark as well. So hopefully this was helpful in understanding what sources are and how to analyze them, how to find sources with signatures and marks, and then how to use them when you're attempting to build a case of identity. And that's